Okay. Glad everyone is here this morning. Was well, church service over a little early today? Did I just get well, a little late? It has been. It has, I mean, we've got about 10 20. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, with no choir, with no. Well, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. You know, with no. Pastors should love that. No turning green. Pastors should love that because they're always. All, all the pastors I ever had to work with are always complaining they never had enough time. And so, you know, I would think that, gosh, he just has a few more points in his sermon. I don't know. Oh, well. <laughs> I did notice, uh, I always go back when they upload the lesson and listen to me, which I don't like doing. Uh, but gosh, I noticed the last lesson was over an hour. And I thought, holy cow. Uh, he, you know, nobody wants to listen to me for an hour. Uh, but I guess we had a lot of good discussion last week. And, uh, but I thought, well, maybe I need to speed it up a little bit or do something <laughs> anyway. But uh, we'll see if we can see how we do this week. Uh, talking about wisdom and, and the other things. A couple of announcements that uh, some of you may have heard uh, uh, that Karen Dickens has tested positive for COVID. No. And so, you know, uh, she, I talked to <coughs> Kelly yesterday, uh, she had lost her sense of smell, which is one of the symptoms of COVID. And it took them couple of days just to get in to see the doctor to get a test, but she got the quick test, and so a few hours later, I think the next morning, Friday morning, she found out that she had tested positive. They gave him the test, but he's got the week-long test or whatever it is, that, so he won't find out until next week if he tests positive. So, I don't know if any of you have been around him recently, so, I think they were here last. They weren't here last week. So, uh, I think they sort of suspect it was grandkids. You know, her her daughter is a flight nurse uh, on the helicopter I think, and so they sort of keep tabs of the grandkids a little bit. And who knows? Because uh, they've they've been very careful. Because uh, you know they do have some pretty things. Did you say Karen? Karen, Karen Dickens? Yeah. yeah. She was here last week. Oh, was she? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They, they, they were back. Her, Kelly and her were here. Oh, were they? I was thinking of Kelly. But anyway, you know, so yeah. if you lose your sense of smell, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. Uh, after I got off the phone, I went around smelling everything. Uh, one other thing, uh, I went in not too long ago and just had the blood test because I was thinking maybe I got it or something and I got over it. And uh, the blood test comes back immediately. So I wonder why Kelly and them can't. I don't know. I, you know, they're, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe they were looking for antibodies. Maybe that's a little, a little faster or something. I, I don't know. He just told me that it would probably be next week uh, or uh, they had a hard time because I guess I thought there was a testing place here in Montgomery County. Uh, not sure. I think you have to make an appointment or something, and it was several days before they finally called their doctor, and he was able to get in the next day. And so, uh, we'll give everybody the benefit of mine. I just go in my doctor's office. They come out, and uh, I waited there like ten minutes, and they come back and hand me a slip of paper. So you, you don't You're good. Have to and hand it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway. Uh, that's the bad news, and I don't know if you consider it good news or bad news, but I'll be teaching for a while longer, so uh, you take it as it is. Okay, Proverbs 3, uh, we're in uh, chapter 3, and looking at it, uh, let's a little, review a little bit from last week, uh, we talked about keeping the teachings uh, and wisdom of God in our heart, I spent a little time talking about the heart, the heart uh, for uh, the Israelites or Judaism was the innermost being, the person you are, the uh, 
place the seed of your soul, your emotions, everything. When he, so when he says, put it in your heart, that means right there into who you are. And that's what he's talking about, the wisdom, your character, emotion, soul, you know, all those things wrapped up into the heart. We talked about never letting loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Uh, then we talked about trusting in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? Your own, your own understanding. understanding. <laughs> you get your control. And uh, then we talked about finally honoring the Lord with your possessions. And I listed several things. Uh, one of the primary ones being it is an act of worship. It is showing God your faith in Him. And so uh, those were the Proverbs or the uh, verses that we looked at last week. This week, we're going to be looking a little further into chapter 3. And I'm going to begin, it wasn't in your lesson uh, as a verse, but in looking at the verses, because I try to look and see, well, is there something I should talk about before I get into the verses in the chapter? Because, you know, these book studies, they tend to take just chunks and sometimes they skip good chunks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I always sort of go through and sort of pick out that maybe there's something that we need to, to back up on. And, and looking at one particular verse, it really caught my eye because I had never, I guess, noticed it before. You know, I don't necessarily read Proverbs regularly, but, and like I said, I've never heard a pastor preach on Proverbs, but. Proverbs 3, some read Proverbs 3, 19 through 20. By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge the deeps were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Yeah. Most of us are very familiar with Genesis, right? And what does it say in Genesis about how God formed the heavens and the earth. He, he created. He created, he, he really sort of spoke them into existence. Here, I thought it was really interesting because it says, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundation. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided clouds, uh, let the dew drops. Uh, what, is, what is Solomon saying here? Seems to be equating wisdom with uh, uh, speech. Yeah. Uh, it's really almost the way I took it uh, is that God's wisdom first of all is very deep expansive and it, it's a creative force isn't it i mean his wisdom put the cosmos created it and put it in order and put it in to motion and got things moving in the right direction and and i guess the thing that i, I thought about is that Everything is balanced, isn't it? You know, his wisdom didn't create chaos. His wisdom didn't create things that, you know, have a, start bouncing into each other and craning off in different directions and everything else. There are certain physical laws of the universe, aren't there? And, you know, we have discovered them over the centuries and and the years put them into scientific formula and, and all those kinds of things but there's a lot we still don't understand uh, you know but everything moves according to a set of rules a pattern uh, it's in balance you know our days are the same length all the time you know, we rotate around the sun we don't go this way and then go this way or some other thing. Uh, you know, it, it's, his wisdom is so deep, his understanding, his knowledge is to the extent that he can create a well-ordered, balanced, harmonious 
universe. So it begs the question of, well, why wouldn't we want to tap into that? You know, why do we want to figure it out on our own? When God has already created something out there that we can't even understand. Uh, we can use it. I, you know, I, I use electricity all the time. I use my cell phone all the time. But it was God's creative knowledge that made it possible for that to be utilized. You know, I, I'm sure there's, I didn't look it up, but I've heard that you know, there are some scientific scientists that said, you know, if the earth had just been a little bit further closer to the sun, things would have been totally different on this planet. Or a little further away, and not by a lot of much. much. Or if it just rotated differently, things would, you know, it wouldn't be the planet it was supposed to be. And so, you know, lots of things, and I guess until I read this, I, we, we tend to read Genesis <coughs> okay. Uh, but this is a little deeper, I think, in saying it was God's wisdom, his understanding, his knowledge that created this universe. And I think Solomon was putting it there saying, hey, <laughs> you know, if God speaks, what? You need to listen. You need to listen. Because <laughs> it is, it's, you know, you may not understand it, <laughs> but hey, you better dwell on it and think about it. Jerry, you know, and plus it pointed out in, uh, under the understanding the context, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I'm just going to read this right quick. There's in that uh, one, two, three, about the third paragraph sound, it says, why does the wisdom that produces lasting, where does the wisdom that produces lasting joy come from? True wisdom is grounded in the person and character of God. And that's yes. what you, you were just saying. Before anything else existed in creation, a wise and holy, all-powerful God existed. <clears throat> it is in Him that all wisdom resides. In the end, wisdom from God produces the life that enables a person to, and this struck me, have a clear conscience. Oh, yeah, and we'll talk about that today. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Yes, uh, it is a wisdom. If, if he can, through his wisdom, can order the universe, do you think he would have a problem ordering our lives uh, and making them harmonious, balanced, uh, you know, all the other words that the psychologists tend to use to in their books, the thousands of books they have written to try to produce the same effect. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting verse, and that's why I wanted to start with that today, because it sort of uh, enforces everything that, that Solomon has said up to now about taking God's wisdom and his understanding and putting it in your heart, keeping it there. We're going to talk about that. Proverbs uh, 3. 21 through 24. Maintain sound wisdom and discretion. My son, don't lose sight of them. They will be <clears throat> light for you and adornment for your neck. Then you will go safely on your way. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down and your sleep will be pleasant. Okay. Uh, you said in the beginning there, uh, Preserve sound judgment and discernment. What my my NIV says preserve, uh, and this one uh, in the quarterly it says maintain, and some of the other versions have something else. Uh, I think uh, keep is one word that I think I saw maybe King James or one of the others. But here it is. Maintain, preserve, keep. What's he saying here? When we practice, practice it. Keep doing it. Yeah. How do you preserve something or keep something? Well, you, you've got to make a conscious effort to you, do it. You do it's just not there. You, you know, you've got to uh, exercise discipline uh, to be able to maintain it, to keep it there. 
He says, don't lose sight of that. In other words, you know, don't let it get out of your sight. Don't uh, disregard it. Don't think it's not of any consequence. But you're going to have to work with this. Isn't something that's that's very important, or very precious, or very uh, treasure? Isn't it important to maintain it? Now, how many people have old cars? You know, antique cars. I see them. <laughs> I see them running around my neighborhood all the time. And and really, I think what they're doing is that he gets in it and turns it on, makes sure the battery's good, and, and he drives it through the neighborhood just to get the engine warm, keep everything circulating, all the fluids and everything else, and just as an act of preservation. Because, you know, if you have something, uh, something like an antique car or plane or something like that, you just set it up, what happens? It begins to deteriorate. You know, the grease starts hardening, the oil doesn't get to the places it needs, the, the seals start getting dry, and so lots of things happen. And so, you know, I think this is what he's saying here. Maintain it, but you maintain it not by just dusting it off all the time, but utilizing it in your own life, using that discipline. And he says there are three benefits from maintaining wisdom and discernment. What are those? Life. So you can lie down without fear and enjoy okay. a drink. Yes. When you lie down, uh, there's two of them. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. What does that mean? You can rest. You have peace. Yeah, you, it, you're confident that nothing bad's going to happen to you. And you'll have a pleasant sleep. You know, how many of us don't have pleasant sleeps all the time? <laughs> Get up in the middle of the night, <laughs> or toss and turn, or whatever else. No, he's saying, hey, you, you, know, you don't need a my pillow or whatever else. Uh, you know, you're going to have a restful sleep. In other words, you're not going to stay awake, tossing and turning, worrying about what's going to happen about tomorrow. Uh, and the one before that is. You will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. Well, he said, you know, there's, there's safety in wisdom and discernment. Because you recognize when something is unsafe. Uh, you recognize when there is something that you need to go around or move out of the way or whatever else. So he was telling us the importance of maintaining, preserving this, and the benefits that we get from it. And hey, at my age, those are good benefits. <laughs> because <laughs> what's the worst thing an older person can do is to stumble and fall out. And so, uh, Tells you the benefits from maintaining the wisdom and sermon. Uh, Proverbs 3, 25 and 26. Don't fear sudden danger or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from a snare. Okay. I was looking at this and I said, okay. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wisdom. Uh, disasters happen. Uh, I mean, some. We have hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, you know, accidents, all kinds of things. Uh, now, how many of you are worriers? Worriers? <laughs> you, you, you know, yes, I've known some worriers in my, in my life. And, and sometimes I'm a worrier. Well, if I, you know, what's going to happen? Is this gonna is this gonna be a bad storm? Uh, or do I need to need to do things on the ground? Or is this a you know, oh this may be a bad situation. Oh this virus, you know, I might catch this virus. What can I do not to catch this virus? Do I need is it okay if I go over here? Uh, if, is it okay if I 
you know, talk to this person or whatever else. Yeah. Should I sell my stock or should I keep it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> should I hold on to that one? Oh man, what's going to happen? Oh, we got an election coming up. You know, there's been a lot of speculation. What's going to happen? You know, there's a lot of things to worry about. And let me tell you, if you're a warrior, <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> it's just out there. And what's God saying? Have no fear. Or the Lord will be your confidence. Now, what do we say? Trust in the Lord. He is our confidence. You know? Don't you think it? Somebody who has... Uh, the wisdom to create a universe, to be able to, it would be, you could feel confident and trusting in him. Uh, he will keep your foot from being snared. In other words, a snare is what? Trap. Trap. <clears throat> He'll keep you away from the traps. And isn't worrying a trap? Uh, it traps you into being anxious, uh, being, you know, always looking out or being concerned or whatever else. And, uh, and, and what are the, some of the, some of the psychologists tell you that 99% of the things you worry about, what? Never happened. <laughs> well, it's that 1%, you know, I need to worry about it. You know, we always come up with excuses to worry about things. And let me tell you, right now, hey, there's plenty out there to worry about. Uh, and a year from now, it'll be another set of things to worry about. So, uh, but remember, the Lord can be your confidence. Proverbs 3, 27 through 29. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow, I'll give it to you. Come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow when you now have it leave. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Okay. Uh, it's interesting that you know, we talk about fear, worry, all these kinds of things, and that wisdom will, will uh, give you this. Now Solomon sort of gives us uh, four uh, ex practical examples of how to use our wisdom, our understanding. Uh, the first picture, uh, he says, uh, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Uh, it, it's sort of the uh, the uh, meaning of you're an employer uh, and people are working for you and if people work for you and they finish their work what do you need to do? Well, you need to pay them. You, know, you don't withhold their pay and say, well, I'll catch you next week. You know, uh, you know, whether you are a manager or whatever else or maybe you just have somebody cutting your yard or what he's saying here is that uh, it's a picture of people who work for us or perform tasks for us, and when their work is completed, they should get paid based on whatever agreed amount or contract or whatever you have. You don't say, oh, I'll catch you next week, or why don't we just, I'll, I'll give you a, a big check at the end of the month, or whatever else. Because why? Well, you probably need the money. They have families to feed. Uh, they have things to purchase. Uh, you know, so don't withhold something that you have. It isn't, God doesn't withhold things from us, unless it's bad for us. <laughs> but uh, uh, now, uh, look at Leviticus 19.13. Do not cheat or rob anyone. Okay. Do not cheat or rob anyone. Uh, was it a little more to that? Or was it another? Well, maybe that was uh, it. Excuse me, yeah, it goes on. Always pay your hired workers promptly. Yeah. Pay your hired workers promptly. <clears throat> and that's what, that's, 
That's all I'm going to say here. Hey, don't be a slacker and pay people what they deserve. Okay, uh, verse 28. What does it say? The second picture. Needing something, you don't say what? Do it tomorrow. Come back tomorrow, maybe I can help you out. Uh, it's not convenient. Or, <clears throat> so, what he's saying is, you know, if you have it, you have the time or the money or the tool or whatever else, give it to them. Now, don't, don't act. Huh? Hesitantly. Hesitantly. Uh, you know, uh, don't like. Don't act like it's a burden for you to help somebody. Yeah. Uh, okay. Have you ever heard? You know, when you, <laughs> the thing that we, that sends blood pressure up in a parent really quick is when you ask your child to do something and they do what? Uh, you know, they give you that shrug, that sigh, like, "Oh, I really have to." <laughs> Oh, I'm busy. You're not doing anything, but I'm busy. <laughs> I've got something I need to do. Or whatever. Yeah. You say, don't act like that. Don't be childish. You know, when your neighbor needs something, get it. Okay, the third picture also involves the neighbor. Verse 29. What does he say? Do not bond against your neighbor, sir. They trust you. Yeah. What's he saying here? Get along with your neighbors. Don't be trying to get revenge or trying to get a yeah. Why would, you, why would you plot against your neighbor? Well, if you know if he does something that aggravates him, <laughs> you, know, you think oh, I'm going to do something to aggravate him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we used to have a term in the military for that. Mad, mutually assured destruction. <laughs> in other words, you know, if you drop a bomb on us, we're going to drop a bomb on you. And then, you know, you drop two bombs, we'll drop two or three. And, you know, this keeps creeping up. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's saying, uh, you know, don't plot against your neighbor. Uh, and what he doesn't say here is, even if your neighbor plots against you, don't plot against your neighbor. More than likely, he says, who lives trustfully near you? This obviously is a good neighbor, a good relationship, but don't plot against them. Uh, it's interesting, and I thought he, that these two situations involve neighbors. Uh, Jesus had a lot to say about neighbors, didn't he, in the New Testament? Someone have Matthew 22, 37 through 39. You know, I was thinking, well, I, I 
thought this was what Jesus you know, would say. This is something fresh. But no, it goes all the way back to Leviticus. And God was already saying this. And I just picked out a few verses here. It was said a number of different times in the Gospels. Uh, you know, I think even Paul had it in uh, Galatians. Uh, but it was said a bunch of times. Usually in the Bible, when it's said a bunch of times, what does it mean? You better pay attention. You better pay attention. It's important. You know, I'm, I'm sort of quit stomping this. You know, if it's said one time, well, you tend to look at it. But if it's said a number of times in a number of different situations, and especially by Jesus, he said it a number of times, times you tend to think, well, this is important. It was said by God, it was said by Solomon, it was said by Jesus. So, yeah, maybe loving your neighbor is important. Okay, now what is the question? Who is, my Who is your neighbor? And how did Jesus answer that? When he was questioned by the educated Pharisee, uh, who said, when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, the educated one, you know, heartedly, probably, uh, said, well, who is my neighbor? Yeah. And what did Jesus tell him? He told them this parable of the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And that was <coughs> a story involving three characters. And the least one was the one that helped the person who had been wrong. And so when he asked the intelligent Pharisee, well, who is the neighbor? Who is the neighbor? The one that was willing to help, no matter what the circumstances, the one who was willing to stop and to render aid who was obviously going somewhere too, but stopped and rendered aid. And I think that's what, if someone had asked Solomon, well, who is this neighbor we're talking about? He would say something similar. So, you know, as we look at these, we tend to think, well, people on my left or people on my right, or hey, I live in a cul-de-sac, I'm the only one there, so I don't have any neighbors. But we don't have neighbors, don't we? So it is dealing with people, people around you, people who are in need, uh, whether they're in front of you at Walmart or cut you off in traffic, <laughs> they would be your neighbors. <laughs> and you want to think of these verses. Uh, there was an interesting experiment. I don't remember all the particulars of it, uh, but it was at a, a, a Bible college where uh, they had a group of, of uh, individuals who were uh, going down the pastoral track, theology, you know, they were going to graduate and be pastors. And uh, they did a little experiment and they told, uh, well, let's see, I don't remember, they told half of them that you have an appointment at a certain time over in this building one of the professors or something like that. And they told the other half that uh, you just need to be over in this building at a certain time. And so it, it was a ways of ways. And so, uh, you know, they, they gave them a certain amount of time. They, they made it where, you know, they had a certain amount of time to get there. And somewhere out there, they stationed someone who needed help. Now, I don't know what the situation was, but it was an obvious situation, and it was on the path that they had to take to get to where they needed to go. Well, what do you think was the result of the experiment? No. Nobody stopped to help. Nobody stopped to help. Uh, some did stop to help, but it wasn't the ones who had a specific time and person to meet. None of them stopped. Uh, because I 
have somewhere I've got to be. You know. Now the ones who you just need to be over here at a certain time, you know, a lot of them stopped and, and persisted <clears throat> because they didn't have something that was trying to catch, capture their atten uh, attention or whatever else. But it, it shows you how so it's so easy to rationalize why you don't stop to help someone or meet some need. Oh, I got something over here to do. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, Jerry, I heard Sherman preach one time about how our mate, our wife is our neighbor. You know. And, <laughs> you know <laughs> and the good Lord, you think, and the good Lord give us a helper. Uh, yeah. and they need help, and sure. you need help, and you're right there with them all the time. So it's real easy to say, ah, I got, I got something else to do. I got yes. another problem. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> man, I, I don't even, I really want to go down that. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I want to touch that because, uh, Lord, that's convicting. Ooh, man, you know, because I can, because I, I know my own self. You know, when my wife you know, calls me up or something like that, and I'm doing something really important, like watching TV, uh, you know, uh, watching Fox, that's really important. Cool. And, you know, doing something like that. And what do I do? I do exactly like my teenager used to be. Dude. Uh. <laughs> or come up with excuse me. I can't, I'm busy right now. <laughs> Yes, and, and especially it, it even becomes more uh, important, uh, more convicting the older you get, right? Especially if your wife needs particular help doing something or whatever else. So, uh, you know, treat them as you want to be treated yourself. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's an interesting sermon. That ought to be given on Father's Day. Probably. Uh, okay. Well, I don't want to go down that road. Please don't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 3.30. Don't accuse anyone without cause, but he is just to go for him. Okay. Uh, why would you accuse someone who's done nothing to you? Jealousy. Jealousy, yeah. Maybe you're mean spirited. I don't know, maybe you're just sort of, yeah. You're, you're real, you've had a bad day. So, you know. To deflect the tension away from you. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I, <clears throat> something about you that doesn't sit right with me, so I to move over. Um, and I was thinking about this, you know, sort of coming up with these things. Jealousy was like my number one. Um, but I kept thinking about it, maybe God kind of pressed on me or, or something, because I thought, wow, could could Gossip be included in this? I mean, isn't that accusing someone who probably has done nothing to us, spreading gossip about them? Uh, Whether it's true or untrue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably. Uh, so here he is, and he's given some very practical examples for his sons, sons, and us today to think about in our own lives, how this might affect us. Uh, now, and, and I guess the amazing thing is, this was written thousands of years ago, but it's as applicable today as it was during Solomon's time. We still struggle with who our neighbor is, helping others, uh, jealousy, gossip, yeah, all of those things uh, that he brings out here. Proverbs 3, 31 and 32. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways, for the Lord detests a perverse man that takes the upright into his confidence. Okay. You know, we studied earlier, a couple of weeks ago, uh, about uh, Solomon warning against falling into temptation to follow the path of a 
violent man or a violent group. You remember when they wanted to go out and rob and maybe kill somebody? He talked about that. And he sort of brings it up again, and he, uh, he he's now looking at it from envy. Uh, do not envy a violent man. Why would you envy this type of person? That they can get stuff done quicker than you can. Yeah. You know, they don't worry about rules, do they? They don't worry about the law. Uh, They're macho like Rambo. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that guy is, man. You know, he, he just walks into the room and people are intimidated by him because they know his history. They know he's a violent man. Uh, and some people look up to that guy. That they don't have followers. You don't have to think, they just use force or power or whatever it takes. So he's going to don't envy this kind of person. What's verse 32 say? says he is an abomination. Uh, and if you look at the actual the, the meaning and connotation, it's disgusting. This person disgusts God. He's wicked, unclean. I mean, you think of all, the, all these kinds of words, that's what God thinks of this violent type of person. In fact, uh, flip over to Psalm 73. You may read uh, 3 through 12. Yes, read 3 through 12. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper <clears throat> despite their wickedness. They seemed to live such a painless life their bodies are so healthy and strong. They aren't troubled like other people or plagued with the problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jewel necklace and their clothing is woven of cruelty. Their fat cats have everything. These fat cats have everything. Their hearts could even wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. And to the people, and so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. Does God realize what is going on, they ask? Is the Most High, even aware of what is happening, look at these arrogant people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Okay, that's good. Uh, so, what do these verses say? You know, Solomon has said, "Do not envy this type of person." This psalm is saying starts off saying what? I have, I envy them. In verse 3, I envy the arrogant. Why? Because I saw them. they have all the stuff. They have no struggles. They don't seem to have any struggles. Their bodies seem to be strong and healthy. Honestly, they have plenty to eat. You know, they don't seem to worry about where the next meal is coming from. They are free from the burdens common to man. What are the burdens common to man? Food, shelter, debt, and work, you know, all those things. He say, they don't seem to have any of that kind of stuff. I mean, they are like, I think what you said, fat cats. <laughs> they, are, they are living the life, the good life. You know, I'm envying that. I think it's really interesting 
in verse 6, it says, what is their necklace? Pride. Pride. Now, what is supposed to be our necklace? Christ. Is Christ? Yeah. Love. Wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah. You know, that is supposed to be, we've read it several times, that that's supposed to be what's around us or on our heads so people can see us as that kind of character. But what is around their necks? Oh, it's the pride. They're proud of being who they are. You know, they don't skulk around. They flaunt it. They got the new car. Not the newest car, but the most expensive the newest car. The biggest boat, the biggest house, whatever. They live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's going through all of these things uh, they scoff and they speak with malice and arrogance. They threaten oppression. They threaten their neighbors. You don't like what I'm doing? I'll come over and beat you up, kick you out, take over your property, whatever else. Because I can do that. And people are attracted to it because they think, well, if I associate myself with them, I'll get some of that stuff too. Part of that envy, part of what Solomon was warning about earlier, don't be trapped into that. Don't, you know. But there are people who get trapped into that, don't they? They want to associate with them because maybe we won't be the strongest or have the most, but we'll get a piece of it. And we'll be part of their group. And people will be afraid of us. And even to the point where in chapter, I mean, in verse 11, what does he say? Verse 11. Uh -huh. Does God realize what is going on, they yeah. ask? Is the Most High even aware of what is happening? Yeah. Don't we think that a lot? I watch the news. <laughs> well, I think, you know, how can this be happening? This is the United States of America. Or, you know, how, how can this go on? And, and we keep on going and we, you know, we'll eventually get to the thought of why would God let this happen? What's happening here? You know, that God knows what's going on. You know? and a lot of times we'll pray to him, God, stop them. Fix them. Get them. You know, because you know, we want justice, don't we? Instant justice. We want the, you know, God is just, and so we want justice. You know, put them in jail or whatever you need to do. They, they, you know, and part of it, I think, is this envy that even we have deep down inside is that we want them to get their comeuppance. We want them to, you know, be down and out. Everything taken away from them. And so it's just natural to say, God, hey, you know, do something about this. And uh, so he's saying, don't, you know, that, don't be tempted to follow this because it's a slippery slope. Um, Proverbs 3.33 Someone read three, Proverbs 3.33 The Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked but he blesses the home of the righteous. Okay. So God is going to curse the wicked. They're an abomination. It Maybe we won't see it, but God is just. They're, you know, they may get it in this life, or they'll get it in the next. 
But it's interesting. Some read Psalm 16 through <coughs> Psalm 73, 16 through 19. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on the slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terror. Ah, okay. So, we can think of life in terms of days, hours, months, years, or whatever else. What does God think <laughs> in terms of eternity? Eternity. You know, uh, what does Paul say? You know, we we look through glasses, rose colored glasses. Yeah, rose colored glasses or glasses that are very tinted or way. You know, we, we can't see clearly, but God does. And yes, these things happen, and uh, we need to stay away from them. But yes. They, when I really talk to God about this, I understand that they are on a slippery slope. And they are going to go down in the ground to ruin. They will be destroyed. And not only destroyed, but completely swept away. In other words, all their stuff <clears throat> will be gone. They will have nothing. And they won't have God. Like I said last week, the exercise of having three things and, and watch them slowly get taken away and destroyed. They don't have in the end. They don't have God. So they will be swept away because God is just. And what does he finally say in 34 and 35? He mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. The wise will inherit honor, but he holds up fools to dishonor. Yes. <clears throat> so he mocks those who mock him, really, or who mock others, but gives grace to the humble those that follow him and aren't tempted to follow this other crowd. The wise inherit honor, but the fools he holds up to shame. You know, last week we were talking about the rich man. And, you know, I, was, you know, we, I said, you know, I've heard sermons that follow up from the rich man who were all the way to Lazarus. And what happened to Lazarus? Uh, he had the ultimate destruction, I guess. Everything he had was swept away. He couldn't even get somebody to come over and give him a drop of water on his tongue. He couldn't even get anybody to go down and warn his brothers. No. He's there. And if Lazarus is ever a real person, where is he today? Still right there. And I think that's the worst thing is that he mocks the problem. So Lazarus has nothing to mock about for any of those who have been falling to that category have anything to, to, uh, to be proud of. And so I think Solomon is saying here, he's given all through these verses today examples of how we are to live wisely and what happens to those who don't, who mock them. And so uh, in this time and in this year, in these situations that we find ourselves in, 
uh, with the politics, the virus, and all the other kind of stuff going on, we need to remember these words. And maybe read Psalm 73, because we didn't read all of it, I just picked out a few verses, but this whole psalm deals with these passages that Solomon is talking about here, and the temptations that are out there to do something to your neighbor, or gossip, or mock, or whatever else, or simply just to worry about it. Because the psalmist said, and the psalmist wasn't David, uh, the psalmist said, until I went back to God and really began to understand his wisdom, that I saw that, hey, they're going to get their justice. Things are going to be okay. And it's not up to me to bring justice to them. And God is going to do it. And he'll do it in a whole better way than I will. I'm only supposed to worry about who? Me. And what do I do? And how I follow God. And what I put around my neck. Do I hang wisdom there? <clears throat> uh, love? Fidelity? All these other characteristics that, that we've been talking about? Or do I hang pride there? Or envy? Or all the other things that will drag me toward this other path? Okay, any questions? Comments? Okay, probably what we're going to be doing, I'll be teaching next week, and uh, we'll be going through Proverbs for a little while longer, but we may end Proverbs a little bit early and go into Song of Solomon and finish that so that we'll get in line with the next series, which will um, start the next series will be on Isaiah I'll stay in the Old Testament and the next series will start the first Sunday in September so I talked to uh, Kelly and I think what we're going to do is there's a couple of weeks there that we're behind, and so we're, we're going to, well, we have two choices, and it'll be if y'all want to discuss it or talk about it. We have two choices. I can either skip a couple of lessons in uh, Psalms, or skip Song of Solomon. There's only two lessons there. Or we can take a two-week break. I, I don't know. Uh, which do you prefer? Any comments or any thoughts? Consider what? A break. A break? Oh, well, you get a break. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what I found? If I take a break, I get in trouble. <laughs> uh, what's the old, what's the old uh, quotation? Uh, Idleness is the devil's playground. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> no, but no. Yeah, sometimes I, I look. My problem is sometimes I look at the lesson and I think, holy cow, how am I going to make a lesson out of that? And, and then when I get into it, you know, I get God reveals things to me and, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, you do <laughs> so, uh, we don't have to decide it right now, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how things go. Uh, what happens with Kelly and the virus and all these other things and see how I do and, and uh, uh, see if we want to continue or if we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks. Uh, but, oh, we'll do that. Uh, does anybody have an update on the class post of the sun? Was there anything mentioned today? Nothing more today, but with the wax is on the wax one and decreasing kidney function yeah. as of the rest of the afternoon. Keep He was in the process of moving. And she has, has, she yes. has moved to Waverly, and so this she is, has moved. She has. Oh, okay. I she has vacated her house. Her belongings are in storage, and 
Well, yeah, this is a mess. Yeah, this, this is a very difficult situation. Yeah. Uh, so we need to be praying for her and her family, and praying for uh, Karen and Kelly, and uh, you know, there's others. Uh, my niece, my Barbara's niece, uh, Teresa, you know, she's the sole caregiver of Barbara's sister and, uh, uh, and her sister's husband. So she's having a very difficult time with hepatitis. Uh, it's a real bad form of hepatitis. So keep their prayers. And I'm sure there are others out there. Uh, and, and we've seen some of the prayer things coming through this week of people who uh, and, and also Priscilla uh, in our class. She's having a crazy time, I guess, because she needs to have, she's had an operation schedule for a couple of months. And because of the virus, hasn't been able to have it. And she's getting ready to have it. And I guess someone in her family tested positive. So they had to uh, <coughs> quarantine. And she doesn't have the virus. But, you know, and uh, it, it's been just a difficult situation for her. her uh, you know, it, it's an operation where she has a growth, I think, in her cheek. Uh, and it's not, uh, it, it's not cancerous or anything like that. But it's a very delicate operation. It takes two doctors to operate because of all the nerves. Yeah. And you know, if they cut the wrong nerves, she may not be able to blink, or she might not be able to smile. So you know, trying to coordinate them all for the virus, you know, it has been sort of a very uh, difficult time for her. And I'm sure there's others that, that uh, you know just don't know about. This is a, I want to say it's a worrisome time. <laughs> it's a trying time. People, I think, you know, are sort of losing their patience. Uh, and I can see where young people are. Uh, you know, when <laughs> I laughed at David when, when he, uh, it was a couple of months ago, when he was saying, uh, how difficult it was to do, stay at home, and you know you could do things, certain things that you've been meaning to do, you, could, you could do, and after a while you finish them or you get tired of doing them, and you get sort of frustrated, and you get sort of lonely because you can't get out, and meet people. And he went through a whole litany of things, and I, I looked at him and I said, "Hey, yeah, we experience those every day. <laughs> You're old as I am. You know, you have all those things." I mean, there was nothing new. <laughs> so, uh, but it is a trying time, and of course, the, the biggest topic for young families right now is: Is school ever going to start? And what are going to be the rules? And uh, I know we, were, Jack and I, were both in the office the other day, and they were talking about maybe the bus routes. They were having to separate the buses, and some of the buses would come through here. And pick up kids and let them off from the night before. So I, I don't know. But everybody's everybody's worrying about it, trying to figure out the scenario. And I don't think anybody has a clue. And so and I guess all I'm saying a lot to say right now is when we trust in God, and that's where you know when you have nothing and you can't fix anything, you don't just sit around and worry about it. Just pray about it. Trust in God. Let Him you know, give you the comfort that no, this too shall pass away. Maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now, we'll be talking about the great pandemic of 2020. The great toilet paper, whatever, of 2020. Okay, let's pray and we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, for these wise words. Uh, and Heavenly Father, we always need to remember where wisdom comes from and that you in your wisdom have created something that's so remarkable that uh, we would never be able to understand it. Uh, but it's here and it's for us. And we thank you for that. And so we just pray that we will look at the world's wisdom as something to sort of stay away from. In 
always lean on your wisdom and not on our understanding. This we pray in Jesus' name.